Welcome to The Generative Edge, the podcast that keeps you up to date with the latest news and events in the world of generative AI. My name is Stephanie, and I am a consultant at Deloitte Central Europe. And hi, I'm Brandon. I am the Natural Language Processing and Generative AI uh, Specialist Lead at Deloitte Central Europe. And we are here to break everything down about the world of generative AI. So folks who are not technical experts, maybe that's you listening now, uh, will be able to understand, make decisions, and feel empowered to implement generative AI in your business. So. With this podcast, we're really hoping to be able to help you all out, and we want to make sure that you understand everything there is to know about generative AI. So let's start with the basics. Uh, so Brandon, can you just tell us like really quick, what is generative AI? Why is it important for people to know about it? Uh, that is a really good question. <laughs> I don't know that I have a really quick answer, but mm. I'll try. <laughs> so AI is really a broad term for artificial intelligence, which encompasses everything from like machine learning to linear regression and statistical models. It's just a lot of math, basically. Um, but the type of AI that we're talking about, generative AI, it uh, has a specific type of output that makes it generative. Um, so we generally split up AI into two different uh, camps. One is discriminative AI. So if if you, you know, give me two different texts and tell me what they belong to. One is a sports article and one is a health article. That's discriminative. You input the text and you get out a label. Uh, generative AI is different because you input something, generally unstructured text or images or something like that, and you get a, a generative space where you need to predict multiple tokens or multiple outputs um, in a sequence or maybe as an image or a video or something like that, uh, and that's what makes it a generative artificial intelligence. So it's actually generating something something new as opposed to just, I don't know, classifying something or organizing it in a certain way. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So obviously with the release of ChatGPT and other large language models, generative AI is like the buzzword, the hype word. We're creating an entire podcast about it. So what is the hype about? So we just said that it's about creating new content, you know, through these models. But where do you see this uh popularity of generative AI going in the business world. Sure. Um, so I think the reason that it's so popular is just because it brings the consumers or people who use these technologies so much closer to the technology. So like, let's like rewind maybe 10 mm -hmm. years and talk to anybody on the street and you ask them something about AI, like how on in your daily life do you use AI? And your answer would be, are you kidding me? <laughs> I don't have anything to do with AI. I don't even know what it is. Um, and, and I doubt even people in the business could really give you a good description of what AI was, what had been implemented, et cetera. Um, now, fast forward to today, um, and the enormous popularity of AI has been driven a lot by large language models because there are so many people who, you know, they're not statisticians, they're not computer scientists, uh, they don't program or whatever, but they do speak a human language. So um, the fact that these large language models are interactive and that you interact with them using natural language, that makes it so much more accessible. So it's almost like everybody can now interact with this, this magical thing that somehow emulates artificial intelligence, uh, or at least it looks like it, right? Um, and that is where the hype is coming from. It's so accessible. It's so easy to use. Uh, it does things that we're not used to seeing be done by a computer. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's where the hype is coming from. So obviously this is you know revolutionary technology. We've heard comparisons of it being like an iPhone moment and all these <laughs> kinds of things. But I'm curious because I'll admit freely, I'm not the most technical person, um, even though I do work with generative AI mm -hmm. practically daily at this point. <laughs> um, where do you see the intersection of the business world and this like very technical, scientific field almost because if I know I've heard you speaking about it offline. <laughs> uh, where do you see this intersection happening? Is there anything that us in the business world really needs to consider when adopting these types of technologies. Mm -hmm. Oh, so much. I don't even know where to begin. You say the whole podcast will be about that. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think um, at the moment it's it's not necessarily that it finds the most use in production, but it's actually a really good conversation activator. Mm -hmm. So it, because it's so accessible, because anybody can use it, and you don't need really specialized knowledge to like type something into GPT, you can show off those functionalities really well and very easily. Um, 
Now, once you've sort of, I guess we call it activating the market in consulting, <laughs> where you like have a discussion and then you talk about what it can do um, and, and then you show it, there's a lot of stuff that generative AI can do that is overlapping with stuff that uh, AI systems before could already do. And they already do them more efficiently uh, and more accurately, um, like text classification or uh, some, well anything other than mathematical operations, basically. <laughs> so um, you can show off very quickly. You can, you can do like a POC in maybe two days or something, something that would have taken a much longer time to do. And you say, look, this is possible. Now, how do we get there? And you've automatically got that hook, that conversation starter. Um, once you get into production, though, that's that is the point where uh, you can really show the differences between some like a use case that really requires generative AI and one that doesn't. Mm -hmm. And when you say that generative AI is this like revolutionary technology, it kind of is, but it also kind of isn't, right? Yeah. Um, GPT has been around for, for four years or so now, um, and with GPT-2, we were already, I mean, generative AI existed before GPTs, basically. Um, it just wasn't very good, and so it didn't have any traction. Yeah. Um, the types of stuff that are possible to do now with generative AI that aren't possible to do with traditional approaches, um, things like uh, abstractive summarization, doing that really well, um, chatbots that don't require rule-based systems, uh, that sort of stuff. So the intersection is basically just activating the market and showing that certain things that are that were not possible are possible and things that were possible are now possible but they're even easier to do and don't require um, a senior developer with 10 years of experience to actually implement yeah and I feel like that's actually something that I've noticed where you really don't need to be like you said this senior engineer technical expert in order not only to implement and create in certain situations but to activate um, and to <laughs> utilize these different solutions and systems, which I think is to that accessibility point that you were talking about. I think that's why the hype is there mm -hmm. and that it's not really, yes, there is definitely a hype bubble. We'll see if it yeah. bursts at some point. Mm -hmm. But I think the hype has, I don't know, support under it because it really is this fantastic technology. But like you said, it's not a a problem solve for every possible solution that right. is out there. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, of course not. How could it be? Exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I make one more comment on the bubble? Yes, okay. please. Yeah. So the hype, um, some of it is warranted, of course, because of like you know lower uh, barrier to entry, whatever, like new use cases, whatever. So like that uh, that all supports part of the hype. Um, but there is some part of the hype that it's like blown out. Like it's it's not this uh, new industrial revolution. I, I don't think it's I would go quite that far. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the news articles that are coming out that have anything to do with generative AI are generally taken from like a paper that comes out of academia and it has some like tiny little tidbit in the abstract about energy usage or about accuracy or parameter size and the science news sites will just go absolutely bonkers about it. So like a really good example of this is um, there, there was a report that came out about the um, energy usage. This is from uh, researchers at Hugging Face and Carnegie Mellon University um, just in December 2023. So uh, they found they tested 88 different models for image generation and text generation estimated how much energy it would require to make a thousand images or to do a thousand text prompts and then uh, basically came to the conclusion that the the most expensive computationally or energy wise model for image generation would require almost as much in, uh, energy as charging 52 percent of a smartphone but yeah, and that's a lot of energy. Yeah. But the majority of them were something like, uh, they were not nearly that high. So mm -hmm. out of the 88 models, it was just one that was that high. The rest of them were, were much lower. Um, so they could generate about 1,000 images on 26% of a phone charge, which is significantly lower. Now, you fast forward one day and you go to <laughs> any of the science news <laughs> websites and like they, they report that generating one image takes as much uh, energy as fully charging a smartphone, which is not at all what the paper said. It's mm. it's so far from reality. And and you see this over and over and over again, and all that information gets regurgitated on LinkedIn. Um, and in this case, it's something, you know, quote unquote, bad about generative AI, the, the energy usage. But in a lot of cases, it's about something good, like, oh, it outperforms people on text summarization with 100% accuracy or 100% accuracy on your search results, whatever. All these things tend to be blown out of proportion 
portion. And it's really difficult as a as a consultant to go to your clients and say, hey, I know this is in the news, but it doesn't actually reflect reality. And there are places where you can go that, you know, scientists and people in academia are keeping records of what the actual numbers look like. Mm-hmm. And that's what you need to pay attention to. Are you telling me that we shouldn't believe everything we read on the <laughs> Internet? Are you really telling us that? I might be leaning in that direction. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that totally makes sense because, I mean, like with any new technology or new thing that's in the news, um, you know, typically we don't try to just take the headlines as is. Mm-hmm. You want to do a bit of due diligence. You want to actually <laughs> read the article, maybe exactly, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Um, and if not, you can also have uh, your GPT summarize it for you if you don't have the time. Um, but I nice think, plug. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's something that you know, for folks, okay, like me, let's say, uh, that are not super technical, mm-hmm. it is this thing to remember that yes, the hype is there. Everyone's excited about this technology. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's going to be people trying to put it down or build it up. Like, Mm -hmm. of course. But if you want the facts, they are out there. Mm -hmm. It just takes maybe a subscription (laughs) to a particular science site or something, uh, you know. Or finding a good consultant, I guess. Or finding a good consultant, (laughs) someone who you really trust and knows that they're going to do due diligence. Yeah. So to that point, I know that there's been a lot of, again, hype Mm -hmm. that, oh, we just, you know, as a company, we just came out with this fantastic new update or this fantastic new model and this and that. And I mean, there's so much of that as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that there is a lot of truth behind that hype. But talking about press releases, talking about headlines, like what are some good practices that you believe people can do just, you know, as we're implementing these solutions as proofs of concepts are coming up, like what can our audience and what can people do to really like make sure they're doing yeah. their due diligence? Uh, the the real answer is, is hire somebody who has the background knowledge to understand everything, not just from generative AI, but natural language processing. Almost all of the generative AI models and the benchmarking uh, that's done on those models comes from something from NLP, from natural language processing. Um, so if you don't have any talent in-house or nobody who's familiar with those technologies, like a really good source of information would be like Hugging Face, uh, which is basically the industry, uh, I would say, like standard for where you go to find other language models. There's thousands, tens of thousands of language models, and they all do different things. They're tra- trained on different data. Um, and they they also keep a, like a leaderboard um, where you can look at the benchmarking statistics across different types of tasks. So um, one of the, I think one of the most important like mm, gauntlets that LLMs go through nowadays is the big bench, which comprises mathematical reasoning, uh, critical thinking, uh, extractive question answering, summarization, lots and lots of different tasks. And they run the the, the new LLM through all those tasks and then benchmark what their score is on, on all of those tests. It's not a perfect system. The scoring isn't perfect. It's it's basically just a lot of math. And, of course, it's really difficult to model language as pure math. Mm. <laughs> not sure if you knew that, but it's really <laughs> difficult. Um, so, uh, you know, if you know what your use case is, go to that leaderboard, find out which one of those benchmarking uh, tests is most closely related to your use case, and then choose a model that performed well on that benchmark. Mm. Um, I think pr- pr- before I, like, switch to another um, topic... There's another leaderboard for uh, semantic textual similarity. It's called STS. Uh, I think it's just STS benchmark or something, which is uh, how semantic search works. It's how like the new uh, vector search, uh, which powers almost every RAG system, uh, retrieval augmented generation system. Uh, so that leaderboard is probably the most important for all generative AI oh, use cases because <laughs> basically everything's built on a RAG system now mm. at this point. Um, so definitely pay attention to that leaderboard. It'll tell you which one of the models is best at creating embeddings, which are mathematical representations of, of unstructured text or images. Uh, and yeah, so just pay attention to those those leaderboards. Yeah, I think it's really great that, you know, like you said, hiring someone or having someone in-house who really is a subject matter expert, of mm-hmm. course, that's going to be, you know, yeah. something that people would want in their company. <laughs> but I think at the same time, knowing that that's not necessarily always easy to do and possible. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, you know, you can always hire a consultant, I guess. Um, (laughs) But I think that having these open, available resources Mm -hmm. to go to 
like you said, the hugging face leaderboards, mm-hmm. things like that. I think it's going to be really helpful as people are navigating this mm-hmm. new space that we find ourselves yeah, in. Yeah, for so, sure. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Well, and that will lead us nicely into our next topic. Tune in next week when we dive into the details of benchmarking, bias, and the model zoo. Ooh. Thank you for listening to The Generative Edge, a Deloitte Central Europe and AWS production. Your hosts are Brandon Eichner, Vyasaraj Kulkarni, and Donovan Sprunk. Our show is executive produced by Stephanie Cohen, Von Schluthra, Ian Masters, and the Deloitte Studio in Prague. Head writers are Stephanie Cohen and Brandon Eichner. Our sound and audio engineer is Wojtek Krasa, who also serves as our editor and videographer. Michal Trusina is our graphic designer. Our marketing and social media are managed by Stephanie Cohen and the Deloitte Studio in Prague. And our theme song was written and produced by Jakub Flaschek. Don't forget to rate and subscribe on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in.